what technology and the data revolution are doing is impacting buying. And that's a big deal because the most important thing about selling is and always has been uh, the buyer. You are back with us here at Tech Innovation Talks, and you know the deal, listener. We bring you sharp, creative content on some of the industry's most prominent topics. I'm your host, Paul C. Thwache, and I can already hear you demanding to know which subject we are covering and who are today's guests. But before I make those highly anticipated reveals, please note that all our previous episodes are available for your viewing pleasure on our rapidly growing YouTube channel, where you should probably already be subscribed by now, right? Okay, enough of the promotional work. Let's focus on the task at hand. Today's topic of conversation is something that affects us all as we bring you a discussion on sales, more specifically sales in the volatile and modern context we currently find ourselves in. And to discuss this topic, I'm thrilled to say we truly have an ace up our sleeve, as I'm delighted to say that today's special guest is Frank Cespedes. Frank is the Senior Lecturer of Business Administration at Harvard Business School and is the author of six books, including the recently released and critically acclaimed Sales Management That Works, available in all good bookstores. And you'll find the link to that book in the description to this video. Hello, Frank. Welcome to the show. First up, how are you? And can you give us a bit more detail of some of your work at Harvard? and maybe share with our audience a, a little bit about where the inspiration behind studying and writing about sales comes from. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to uh, the show. And uh, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. Uh, you ask about my background. My background is not that exotic. Uh, I got my doctorate, started uh, teaching at uh, Harvard Business School, made my way up the uh, hierarchy. Uh, and my uh, research had always concerned companies go to market channels and in particular their sales channels. But after about 10 years as an academic with some others, I left, started a firm, ran that firm uh, for 11 years. And uh, as you know, when you've got to meet payroll every month, that increases your interest and respect for sales. Uh, got lucky with that company. We sold it. I came back to academia, and that brings us up to date. And completing the lineup today, I'm delighted to welcome back MJV CEO Mauricio Viana. Good to have you back with us, Mauricio. Uh, when it comes to sales, what are you most looking forward to discussing with us today? And also, can you tell us a little bit about your TED, recent TED Talk sounding without too many spoilers? Thank you, Paul. I'm delighted to be back today to the show. And it's also an honor to, to uh, share um, the show with, with Frank, my dear friend and professor. So I'm looking forward uh, to discussing um, about uh, sales management in this uh, new world, new complex world. And also mention a little bit about uh, my TED talk, which was about uh, uh, how to adapt in, uh, in a VUCA and Benny world. Before we go any further, I think we should kind of set the table, if you will. I believe it would be beneficial for our listeners to have a bit of perspective of the current sales context. So, Frank, maybe I can ask you to start off by giving us a bit of background. There's no doubt things are changing. There's no doubt whatsoever that uh, technology, the, um, the sustained data revolution, which will continue throughout our lifetimes and careers are impacting buying and selling. Now, are companies adapting to those changes? At best, it's a work in progress. And at worst, uh, and this is in some ways what uh, the research in my book indicates, but at worst, many companies have failed to adapt. They're, uh, they're dealing with uh, obsolete uh, sales models. What technology and the data revolution are doing is impacting buying. And that's a big deal because the most important thing about selling is and always has been uh, the buyer. Now, that's not making salespeople uh, disintermediated as, uh, you know, to use the current jargon. The number of salespeople in the United States has consistently increased 
throughout the 21st century, even as the internet has increased in scale, scope, bandwidth, and so forth, but it's now an omni-channel buying world. Prospects, customers are online, offline at multiple times during their buying journeys in most categories, both B2C and B2B. That doesn't mean the demise of the salesperson, but it affects marketing and sales requirements in many core areas. People, who you have to hire, what they need to know, pricing, performance management practices, and productivity. And we're in the process of seeing those changes and one hopes adaptations. Wow, there's, there's a lot to, to get us started off with there. Thanks a lot for that, Frank. So Mauricio, you mentioned before that you recently spoke on Tech Talks about the terms Bani and VUCA, uh, which seem to have relevance to the sales environment we are discussing. It would be fantastic if you gave us a little bit of a breakdown on those terms, what they mean, how do they emerge? Well, first of all, the term VUCA stands for um, a world that is uh, volatile, uncertain, um, complex, and ambiguous. This is a term that was coined by the military um, uh, around uh, 80, 1989 and has been, been used by, by several companies. It, it, uh, it's a term that actually explained a little bit, you know, what, what was the world uh, uh, during, the, during those times. Um, then we had the pandemic, which, uh, which changed everything. Um, and there's uh, this uh, famous uh, future, you know, that does future studies. Uh, his name is called Jamé uh, Cassio at the Institute of the Future, who coined another term, which is called bunny, which stands for uh, a world that is brittle um, and actually is anxious, um, nonlinear and incomprehensible. Um, and what happened really, uh, at least in, in my understanding, is that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, the VUCA got stressed, got stressed out, got so, you know, it, it, and, it, it, and it got stretched. So what it was um, volatile became brittle and broke. What it was uncertain, it was so uncertain, the level of uncertainty with the pandemic reached you know, peak levels that uh, we became all anxious. Um, the complexity of the world, uh, the interconnected systems, the globalization, you know, went to a point that now it's nonlinear and uh, the, the ambiguity now is so, is so big that it's incomprehensible. So now, how can you know, we manage our sales team and how can sales thrive in, a, in an environment like that, that it's completely incomprehensible, where the buyers are extremely anxious. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, the, the environment we are in now. So, and, and, and this is where I think there's definitely opportunity, you know, adding to what Frank mentioned uh, before, to understand the buyer. It's definitely very, very important to understand the buying process and uh, and, 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 and things has, you know, has changed. Now the, the buying process is not just by one person, and I'm sure Frank will, will add more to this. It's, it's really um, a, a stream of different, uh, and, and I know you mentioned, I, I read uh, your, your book, uh, uh, Frank, you mentioned this, uh, which I totally agree. The fact that uh, you have, uh, you know, the sales process now is more complex you have to influence a lot of people, it's not one person making the decision to buy. Yes, it's, uh, it's challenging times. Yeah, you, you, you certainly paint quite a, a, a bleak picture with regards to some of the confusion out there. Frank, I, I guess, and you've already mentioned this slightly, but I guess the, the whole perspective of, perspective of how pricing has become so crucial is an aspect of this that we, we definitely have to look at. It seems like if you make one mistake in pricing, that can have major ramifications on a company. What sort of pressure does that put on a company to get their pricings right? And maybe most interestingly to our audience, what can be done by companies to ensure that their pricing plans are correct? Pricing uh, is, and always has been a moment of truth 
uh, in business. I mean, uh, I learned this when I left academia and ran a business. I learned that so much talk about business is just talk until you get to the issue of price. Then you either get the price or you don't. Uh, it's a moment of truth. It's where you test in the marketplace the coherence of your business strategy and your value proposition. Now, uh, what can companies do about this in this uh, uncertain world? Um, you know, change is perennial in business. There's always been change, right? I mean, we talk about creative destruction, and I think the pace of change is increasing, but I don't think it's incomprehensible. In fact, quite the opposite. I think we've got more and more data and tools to make sense of what is going on out there, even as the pace of change increases. And pricing is a very, very good example of that. There are more and more tools available to do price testing. And they're good tools because they're digital tools that get at behavior. Historically, most companies have tried to test price using surveys, a terrible way to figure out customers' potential willingness to pay. Not that many customers wake up in the morning and say, boy, I really want to pay a higher price today. Surveys are very unreliable for that reason. And also because we know there are always big differences between what people say in surveys and their actual behavior in the marketplace. But now we've got good tools where you can actually get a fix and comprehend behavior. People click or they don't click. They buy or they don't buy with these tools. But again, any tool is only as good as the person using it, as good as the managers, their ability to ask the right questions and use those tools appropriately. But what I see, and you'll see many examples of this uh, in my book, what I see is that actually this uh, VUCA Bonnie world is opening up more and more opportunities for value-based pricing, as opposed to what most companies have done historically, cost-based pricing. But in order to do that, you need the data and you need to know what the relevant unit of value is. But it's an area where technology can help. When you when you spoke about pricing there, I, I got the impression that you had a, a company or, and obviously we're not going to name any lanes, but it sounded like you had a, an experience in mind of a company that seemed to have set everything up. They've invested in a whole bunch of things but they've got their pricing wrong. Have you got sort of a, a concrete example of that that you can kind of share with us? Oh, well, well I think we read about examples of this uh, daily. I mean, if you think about what happened during the pandemic, you know, the, the one of the brute facts about the pandemic is that it was not an equal opportunity plague. It simply wasn't, right? There were uh, many companies, uh, services companies, which you know, are the majority in our economy that depend on getting people together in physical proximity. For them, the pandemic, very, very bad news. But there were many other companies, tech companies, where it was one of the best things that ever happened to them. But notice what's happened to many of those companies as we hopefully emerge from the pandemic. I'm thinking about Peloton, Zoom, Spotify, many others. They took so-called new normals as really normals, as opposed to what was happening in a once-in-a-century pandemic. And if you look at their pricing, even over the last six months, it looks like a ski slope in Aspen. So, you know, I think there are many, many examples of this. But increasingly, there's no excuse for that because, in fact, you could have been testing then you could have been testing six months ago. You should be testing today. I guess the message you're, you're passing on is that adaption needs to be key and you need to stay ahead of the game. Mauricio, from what I've grasped so much so far from Frank, it seems like there's a massive importance to, to stay up to date with technologies and to transform your business and the environment in which it works. How can MJV help with this process? At MJV, we, we are experts on design thinking which is a methodology that is basically human-centered. And by understanding 
um, the different touch points of, of the buyer and the company and, and the seller, um, it's, a, it's an excellent way to understand where we can improve our services and how can we influence the, the process so that the sales is, is, is completed. I mean, through design thinking, we have several tools like empathy, like prototyping. Frank was, was mentioning about uh, testing, validating price. Uh, this, is, this is something that uh, through uh, prototyping mechanisms, um, not only just asking people, you know, what, uh, what they think about the price, but actually observing, you know, them in, in the process. And, and, and also um, adding the, um, the fact that uh, at MJV, we have uh, digital capabilities. So we can uh, combine whatever solution was done through the, you know, in terms of strategic um, recommendations, but also implement them. We, we are an end-to-end -end company. Frank, uh, let's talk a little bit about leadership now. Uh, I think this is maybe the, the part of our discussion today I've been most looking forward to. Uh, when, when it comes to sales, there's always um, some very interesting, might I say, kind of directions that some leaders go in with regards to sales. Uh, can you discuss how, how sales has changed with regards to leadership? Uh, what are some of the things that leaders are now doing which they didn't do in the past? And where are some senior executives making mistakes and letting their sales teams down? I'm thinking also about training in a way, like how are they training in a different way these days? Well, let me, uh, let me begin with the, um, the bad news here, uh, because it is bad news. Uh, there is a growing gap in many, many companies between uh, the C-suite, the senior executives, and uh, what goes on in customer acquisition and retention. Uh, I had a colleague uh, at Harvard Business School, her name was Ju Julie Wolf. She did a wonderful uh, bit of research. She looked at the C-suites of the global 1200, you know, 1200 biggest companies around the world. And what she found is that over the past 25 years on average, the number of executives reporting to the CEO in those companies has doubled, twice as many. But then if you ask yourself, who are these people? Where did they come from? What were they doing in their careers before they became senior executives? Very few of them were actually general managers in the sense in which we typically use that phrase in management schools. By a general manager, we usually mean somebody who is running a line of business or had P&L responsibility. Most of those people were specialists, the CIO, the CMO, uh, the uh, uh, CFO. 25 years ago, there were actually more uh, chief operating officers than CFOs in the global 1200. Now it's the opposite. Now, why is that? And it gets back to some of the things Mauricio was saying. Uh, it, it's a more complex world. It, there's a data revolution going on. It's now a full-time job if you're running marketing or operations or whatever. But the reality at the C-suite level in many companies is that A, they are functionally siloed, and B, fewer people than ever before have made it to the top with prolonged prior experience in customer contact activities like marketing and sales. Now that's a big deal and it's a problem because it gets to, it, it strikes at the heart of one of the key responsibilities of senior executives. One of their key responsibilities is to put together a market relevant business strategy. And it's very tough to do that if you're out of touch with what's going on in sales and business development. This doesn't mean that all senior executives need to be sales managers. That's not the point. That would be a disaster. But they do need to know the questions to ask about their sales model in a changing omni-channel buying world. And the reality is that many of them do not. So that's a, that's a growing gap in many, many companies. If you were asked, Frank, to go into a company and, and kind of shape up the sales team and the, the, the sales department, what would be like the first 
top three things that you would investigate? Would it be that gap and, and making sure that there, there is a better connection between the, the sea levels? What would you do? What would be the first three things maybe you'd go in and try and fix? Well, you know, I'm going to use a variation on the uh, standard and still good phrase about retailing. Uh, the first three things I would work on are people, people, and people, right? <laughs> uh, and that is both at the top and at the uh, coal face. Yes, you need alignment. If your senior team is developing or trying to execute strategy without an understanding of how customer acquisition and retention really work today, not yesterday, you got a problem. So get out of the office, travel, go, go out there. All right. That's, that's number one. Number two, there is a big talent issue in sales. Uh, in uh, again, you know, use VUCA, Bonnie, any terminology you want, but in a changing world, the competencies required to sell effectively in many companies is changing. So you want to pay attention to hiring. And it's important to notice that there always have been challenges in sales hiring that just do not exist to the same extent in any in other business functions. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you want to hire an engineer, you can go to a school and it's a little bit like walking into a food court. You know, what are you interested in? Chemical engineering, electrical engineering. If you want to hire people in finance or accounting, you can find people that majored in those subjects. Same is true and increasingly true for coders, for computer programmers. But if you look at the United States, of the about 4,500 colleges and universities in the U.S., less than 300 even offer a sales course, let alone a sales program. So this is an area of business where most people start out knowing very, very little, in fact, almost nothing about what they're going to get paid for. And that leads to the next and third people issue which, uh, Paul, you alluded to earlier, training and development. It's a requirement. And companies already spend a ton in this area. On average, they spend 20% more per capita per person on sales training than any other area. But the ROI on that training is notoriously disappointing. And there are systemic reasons for that. So again, uh, in this area, you start with people at the top, what you're doing to develop them, and notice the hiring. It is, you know, it's not popular to say this. It's just true. It's difficult to train and develop somebody who is a poor fit for the job in the first place. So hiring and training are absolutely linked uh, in sales. And it's getting more, uh, more complex because uh, the data revolution is making sales, ironically, more of a data intensive activity. Reps really do need to know more now than they did 10 years ago because the customers, their prospects can get product and price information with a couple of clicks. So keep that idea about um, the hiring and the having the, the, the superstar salesperson in mind. I, I, I want to come back to that in a minute. Mauricio, uh, Frank's talking about people, putting people first. And we've also mentioned so far that it's important to put the buyer first. Can you talk about some of the principles of putting the customer first and maybe discuss some of the technologies and processes that you can use to make sure that customer is put first? We have a, we have an exercise when, you know, that we, when we brought in the, the full team of executives that were participating in the project. And we call this exercise a constellation exercise. And what it is, is basically to place them in a room and have them uh, simulate what happened during the week. So we would have, let's say, the accounts receivable in one place, the, I don't know, the CEO in another, the call center in another, and each one describing what happened during that week. I was amazed that uh, during their presentation, I didn't hear the word customer even a single time. So after they explained what happened during their week, I asked them the, as just a simple question. 
What about the customer? You haven't talked with the customer during this week? So it so so they all got surprised, you know. Customer, yes, yes. This is the one of the reasons why we exist as a company, and uh, so yes, uh, customer is is very important. Um, and understanding, obviously, the buyer, the customer is is critical. Um, MJV through through design thinking, we are pioneers. And we were are pioneers in design thinking. More than thirteen years, we brought design thinking to, to Latin America. We send our business consultants to the field, and uh, interestingly, we find so many insights that are very helpful to, to our clients. Our clients really enjoy by going out in the field with us. It's something that they don't necessarily do during their week. Um, I don't know why. I mean, and uh, we are here to help, but that's something that uh, definitely helps by being with the customer, living their lives. There, there were situations where um, we would go through the whole process, you know, like um, like going to, into a hospital to understand what happens when you go to an emergency room or when you go to, to, to do an exam, you know, just, just simulating the whole uh, customer journey yourself as a, as a, let's say, as an employee of the company definitely works uh, in, in your favor of understanding the buyer, what he goes through. Mauricio, that exercise that MJV does is is very, very useful, and it, it illustrates a couple of things. Um, one of them, you know, the way I once heard Sam Walton of Walmart say this to his senior executives, he said, now remember, uh, there ain't many customers at headquarters, right? If you're going to meet your numbers, you're not going to meet them talking to each other. You're going to meet them, you know, talking outside the building, and the second thing, and, and again, this, this gets us back to one of the big changes going on, because of the changes in buying, sales is increasingly a cross-functional activity. Think about the exercise uh, Mauricio was describing. And the reason is because what online technologies do is allow customers to touch the selling company at many different points and places not just sales, but when the customer has a problem, you know, it's a little bit like the old thing in the uh, wonderful movie Ghostbusters. Remember, you know, the tagline there, when you see a ghost, who are you going to call? Well, what the research tells us is over 80% of the time, when the customer has a problem, they call the person who sold it to them. So no matter what their job description says, one of the jobs of the salesperson is to go back into their company and cross their own company's organizational boundaries and get it fixed. That's not easy. And that's exactly what the MJV exercise illustrates. Frank, um, I think it, it's fair to say that at some point or other, everyone has contacts with some sort of sales jobs, even if they kid themselves into thinking that they're not working in sales. I myself, I've worked in recruitment selling. And I remember, and this kind of touches on what you were saying about finding the right staff and finding the hiring and, and such. I remember there being a huge disparity between who was selling and who wasn't. And to be honest with you, a lot of it seemed to come down to kind of good old fashioned charisma and a lot of confidence. Um, do you agree with this, that, that sometimes certain people just have a magic touch? Or do you think there is a much better way of evaluating this process and finding the right start? Essentially, what yeah. I'm asking you is, have things changed over the last five years in regards to hiring? Well, I mean, you're asking um, a good and perennial question. And I don't want to sound like a parody of the, uh, you know, the Harvard professor who says, uh, on the one hand, yes, on the other hand, no. But uh, that is what I'm going to say. And it's, I think it's important to keep these distinctions in mind. First of all, there are such things as stars in sales. The research about this is definitive. In most sales forces, the best salespeople, the top 20%, are not just a little bit better than the average salesperson in that organization they're usually orders of magnitude better. So there are such things as stars. 
uh, in that sense, you know, charisma, talent, whatever you want to call it, some people got the mojo. That That's what the research tells you. But stardom is not easily portable, all right? Uh, sales is very, very context specific. And it's ultimately a performance art. And in business, there's no such thing as performance in the abstract. There's only performance in our company, in our market, with our products at our price. I mean, for example, most executives have the experience of hiring someone who was a sales star at company A. And somehow when she gets to our firm, she's no longer a star. Now think about that. What happened? It's not as though that person suddenly got stupid or lost their individual capabilities. But so much of effectiveness in sales depends not only on someone's skills externally with clients, it also depends on their ability to develop relationships in their own firm with the people in product, service, and so forth. And when someone leaves company A and comes to company B, they leave all of that behind, they have to recreate it. And in fact, one of the key purposes of onboarding, of training, of development, and for that matter, leadership should be to accelerate that process of uh, developing the relationship. So getting back to your question, Paul, there are such things as stars. There is such a thing as charisma and, you know, above average talent in sales, but it's context specific. Uh, there, you know, there's a lot of research about sales personalities and uh, it doesn't generalize. The same person who's got a great, great personality and set of skills for selling X isn't the person for selling Y. Uh, it's the broadest keyboard in the business world. Well, I can imagine a lot of uh, disappointed executives hiring a, a superstar seller and then finding out that they don't fit the model of what they're selling. One of the things you touched on earlier was the mistakes made with regards to training and hiring. Is there anything you want to touch on there with regards to that lack of return of investment? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, most sales training is episodic at a point in time. Uh, usually when the company is introducing a new product, they bring in the reps, they're bombarded with a lot of information. And what the learning and development people call the forgetting curve is very, very steep. What the research indicates, and, and these are real numbers uh, across industries, most salespeople forget 80% of what they learned in a seminar within 60 days. All right, so that's, that's a good example of uh, short uh, termism. The other thing is to understand the basics about adult learning, because sales is a great example of that. Most salespeople learn the most. They develop the most, not in the classroom or in the seminar. They, they learn on the job. And they're a good example of what the theorists call modeling behavior. They look at that top 20% in their, in their organization and they observe them and they learn. And they say, basically, you know, the way you dealt with that price objection, that was really clever. The way you frame the value proposition, that's the way I'm going to do it the next time. Part of the purpose of training, and here, as Mauricio knows, technology used appropriately can help tremendously. Design thinking is very, very relevant here. This is an area where technology can help you accelerate that best practice learning. And then the third thing uh, that I would say is um, understand the way adults learn. Adults are not studying for the final exam in my course. They pay attention to information when they need it and where they need it. And in sales, that usually means on your way to a sales call or during the actual sales conversation. And again, this is an area where there are now lots of good technologies that can help facilitate that just-in-time learning but as always, any tool is only as good as the user. Uh, it's how managers use it. Managers must manage here. It's interesting to hear, Frank, what you're saying about also 
learning on the job. Um, once I, I had uh, a couple of sales people working uh, with me and I illustrated a situation that I had gone through, which was uh, there was this director of a bank, you know, we, we helped him um, during the process of an M&A where he was the, the acquirer. I was in Rio at the time. After the, the merge and acquisition was, was finished, he moved back to Sao Paulo. So I went to travel to Sao Paulo and, and, uh, and I took, you know, brought with me one of our top directors. And we, we went there to discuss about, uh, at the time was about uh, project management, how to establish a, a PMO office. Anyway, so when I got there, this director, you know, had a, you know, had a relationship with, with, with me and, and with us. Um, and uh, I, I arrived at the meeting and he said, oh, Mauricio, uh, unfortunately, um, my vice president called me now. And I had traveled from Rio just specifically to meet him. Uh, my, my vice president called me and you have 13 minutes to tell me, you know, what, uh, what you, you're, you're going to talk. And I said, only 13 minutes. And he said, 10 minutes. <laughs> so what, what do you do in that situation? I don't know, Frank, what would you, what would you have done in that situation? <laughs> Well, I, I think there are a couple of principles that are relevant there. The first one is uh, there's no margin in uh, telling the customer to uh, go to hell, all right, either directly or indirect. The second thing I would say, you know, the situation you're describing where you get to Rio, you thought you had, you know, whatever it is, two hours, you got 10 minutes, that's not that uncommon. And it's important to recognize that the buyer has privileges that the seller does not. It is ultimately the seller's job to adapt to the buyer. It's not the buyer's responsibility to adapt to the seller. And the third thing I would say is I think experienced salespeople learn about this through the school of hard knocks. What do you do in that 10 minutes? You don't focus on everything. You focus on the most important thing at that point in the sales cycle. What is it? If it's our first call, you spend those 10 minutes saying, Look, what is the issue here? What is the problem? What is the, what is the outcome that you're looking for? If it's farther on in the sales cycle, you focus on what you believe is the most important thing about the solution you're bringing. So again, um, you know, is it fair that one shows up and the buyer arbitrarily uh, cuts down uh, the, um, the amount of time? No. But as they say in the gangster movies, you chose this life. That's just the way it works. <laughs> but one of the things that you're both kind of touching on here is the language that we use, the communication we make when we're, we're, when we're selling things as a company. And uh, I'm thinking to myself that it must have changed recently, that, that the way that we've got so many visuals and we've got these digital options to kind of sell our things on so many different channels, um, I'd imagine more is less these days with regards to the language you use. I'm also aware of the ESG culture that we have, where we need to be very careful of what we say and we need to be respectful towards different industries and the environment, for example. So it would be great for both of you to touch on those two areas of language and also talk a little bit about the omni-channel approach. Well, yeah, I mean, language is always important, you know. Um... Uh, he, he, I don't care how good uh, a leader uh, someone is, uh, I guarantee that their people are not mind readers. In business, the way you communicate is through the medium of language. That is true now, it's always been true, will always uh, be true. Uh, language changes in the area we're talking about on this session, Paul, the most important language is the language the buyer uses, and that will vary. Sales is very, very context specific. Selling software is different than selling capital goods, different than selling professional services. So it's the language uh, of, uh, of the buyer. And then the third thing, and I, I think what you learn as you uh, get older and more experienced in business, uh, you know, once upon a time, 
I had a, uh, you know, I looked like uh, Jimi Hendrix uh, up here. But one of the things I've noticed in my career are always true. And yet the language for talking about those perennial truths changes. Tech is a great example. I mean, tech people love to reinvent wheels. They love to rename, rebrand things that we've known for 100 years, right? We no longer talk about word of mouth. We talk about, quote, virality. Uh, we no longer talk about white papers. We talk about, quote, content marketing. Um, I, I think you have to be patient with that because every generation has to relearn these perennial truths, and they very often use new language for it. Now, do you say anything to add on the, the omni-channel approach to selling? I guess just to, to reinforce the need to understand the buyer experience. So that, that needs to be designed, understood, well understood. And especially nowadays with, with the concerns about uh, the environment, you know, the, the ESG, social and, and governance, um, it's, it's, it's very important to be you know, politically correct um, in terms of that experience. Yes, I, I would, I would um, emphasize the, the need of, of designing that and understanding, you know, how your customer behaves, all, especially the, the, the touch points of the interactions with your customer. And if he buys uh, online and, and picks up uh, offline at your store, you know, how, how is that experience designed so that he doesn't feel that he's buying you know, picking up his, his item from a different company. Um, so that, uh, I mean, the branding aspect also needs to be there. So he knows, uh, he, you know, he has a seamless experience throughout the whole, the whole process. Take some takeaways from what you've both said today. I, I guess the, the original one was to kind of adapt to the environment you're, you're put in. The second one was clearly to be clear on your pricing and have research behind your pricing. After that, you've talked about uh, the need to be aware of your customer, the buyer, talk the language of the buyer. And then there's also the importance of respecting the environment you're in and also making sure you sell things on an omni-channel approach. Is there anything I've missed there, Frank, that you would stress that maybe we can cover before we go out? No, I think you've done a good job um, summarizing it. The only thing I would add, and I, you know, I always like to quote this, it's uh, from a novel uh, by John Le Carre, you know, so many of our listeners may have read novels by uh, Le Carre, he, you know, spy novels uh, and so forth. But in one of his uh, novels, one of his characters says something that I think should be, you know, on every executive's desk, tattooed on prominent body parts. He says a desk is a dangerous place from which to watch the world. And that is true. Uh, you, you you just can't do that uh, simply by staring into the computer. And a lot of people believe they can do it that way. But uh, I, I would just add a desk is a dangerous place from which to uh, watch the world. Uh, you need data, but you also need that lived experience of customer contact. Okay, listener, there you have it. Our panel has said it all when it comes to sales. A huge thank you to both Frank and Mauricio. Check out the link in the description where we have shared with you some relevant material, including links to both Mauricio's TED Talk speech and Frank's book, and maybe a couple of other goodies thrown in along the way. Now, if this episode doesn't deserve your subscription, I don't know what will. So if you haven't already done so, do go ahead and smash that like and subscribe button. But that just about does it for now. This is Paul C. Thwache signing off for Tech Innovation Talks powered by MJV. So until next time, Please do take care and of course, keep innovating.